Let's turn in our Bibles. <laughs> to the general epistle of James. <laughs> yeah, Jeff. <laughs> James a servant of God. He describes himself only as a servant. The word doulos is bond slave of God. It's interesting to me that he was content in just being known as a servant of God. You think of that in, in light of what has happened in a part of the church uh, where they like to be known by very pompous and highfalutin names. Um, His Most Holiness or the Most Holy Right Reverend or Bishop or, you know, where people like titles. James was satisfied and content with just being known as a bond slave of God. It's commonly accepted that this is the James who was a half-brother to Jesus. When Jesus came to Nazareth, and began to minister in the synagogue. We read that many hearing him were astonished, and they said, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So the people of Nazareth, knowing Jesus, were astonished as he began his public ministry. They knew him as a carpenter. They knew him as the brother of James and Joseph and Jude. Simon. Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians in chapter 1 9, uh, makes a reference to James as the Lord's brother, 119 rather. But other of the apostles, he said, I saw none except for James, the Lord's brother. Of course, this sort of shoots down the uh, dogma of the Catholic Church which teaches the perpetual virginity of Mary. If he is indeed the half-brother of Jesus, then he is the brother of Jude who wrote the little epistle by the same name. The, as Jude writes his epistle, he said, Jude, the servant or bond slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Uh, it would seem that the brothers of Jesus did not believe on him during his ministry. Their conversion, it would seem, came after the resurrection. And Paul tells us in the Corinthian epistles how that he appeared unto James. Uh, in John chapter 7, verse 2 through 5, we read that the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brothers said unto him, Depart from here and go to Judea, 
that your disciples also may see the works that you do. For there is no man that does anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For we read, for neither did his brothers believe in him. At one time, the brothers of Jesus came to Capernaum with Mary, his mother, and while Jesus was talking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers were standing outside desiring to speak with him. So one said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are without. They desire to speak with you. So it would appear that once Jesus rose from the dead, their doubts were dissolved. Now James became a leader in the early church. When Peter was miraculously freed from prison by the angel, and he went to the house where the church was praying for him. When he showed that God had delivered him and set him free, uh, Peter left them and he told them, just hold your peace. Uh, the Lord has brought me out of prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brothers. And he departed to another place. When the first church council was convened in Jerusalem, in order to determine uh, what relationship the Gentile believers should have to the Mosaic law, it was James who more or less concluded the arguments and, and gave the directions for how they were to write to the Gentile believers. Acts 15, 13. And after they held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. For known unto God are all of his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city those that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then it pleased all of the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, and the chief men among the brethren. So uh, James became more or less uh, the leader or one of the leaders in the early church. Paul makes reference to him in Galatians 2.9, and he said, And when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be the pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen and they to the circumcision. So Paul refers to him as one of the pillars, uh, seemingly at least one of the pillars in the early church. Uh, in Acts 21.18, when Paul came to Jerusalem uh, with the offering from the Gentile churches, uh, he first went to James, uh, and uh, the elders were present with him. And it was James who suggested to Paul that because of the number of Jews that had come to the faith, that Paul go ahead and sponsor some young men who were uh, under a vow in order that they might be purified for the 
uh, holy days that were coming. Uh, Paul, uh, also in Galatians 2.12, said, For before that certain came from James. So uh, that is from the church in Jerusalem. So James became uh, one of the leaders uh, of the church in Jerusalem. Now he refers to himself simply as a bond slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't call himself an apostle. Now, this to me is interesting because when they decided that they needed to choose someone to take the place of Judas Iscariot, to be numbered with the 12 apostles, James no doubt was present at that gathering. But he was not considered as a candidate to be named as an apostle. You remember they chose Barsabas and Matthias. Uh, but uh, James being there, it is interesting that he was not even uh, one of those that was considered uh, even to be named as an apostle. One of the requirements of apostleship was that they had seen the risen Lord. And James had seen the risen Lord. However, another requirement for the apostleship in the early church was one who had accompanied with us from the beginning. And that's probably what disqualified James from being considered one of the apostles because he did not travel with Jesus during the earthly ministry of Jesus. On occasions, he was there, but he wasn't a constant companion as were the other disciples who were called to be apostles. A bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Really, <laughs> there is no higher calling or position or rank than that of being a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. As a slave, you have all of the benefits of living in the household of your master. For your master looks after you. He takes care of your every need. And you can live in all of the splendor and the glory of your master's house, enjoying the riches and the benefits of your master's wealth. When we were in Hawaii, we were there on, on Diamond Head watching the windsurfers down below. And I pointed out to the grandchildren the Doris Duke Mansion, that beautiful, beautiful mansion that was right down near the water's edge with those big glass uh, windows looking out over this absolutely fantastic view. A, a mansion of just exquisite beauty, expensive furnishings. Now, the servants of Doris Duke had the advantage of living in the midst of all of that splendor. The advantage of looking out at that beautiful view back towards Diamond Head. And, and they, they had all of, of that which was hers. They were living there also. 
And as they were working, here it is all right there, because they were her servants. Now, as servants of the Lord, the same kind of benefits are ours. We can live in the enjoyment of all of the glories and the beauties of the kingdom of God. Oh, what privileges and what blessings come to us as just the servants or bond slaves of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Lord is not his name. It is his title. When, G when James says, I am his bond slave, then Jesus is my Lord. He is the master whom I serve. Lord signifies the relationship, the master or the Lord and the servant. Jesus said, not all who say Lord, Lord are going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father. There are a lot of people today who use the word Lord as a name rather than as a title. And they often refer to the Lord Jesus Christ as though it's first, middle, and last name, not realizing that it's a title. There probably should be in the scriptures a comma after the Lord, and then you get the sense of it being separate from his name. It's the title. It signifies relationship. And as I call him my Lord, and he said to his disciples, you do call me Lord and Master, and that is correct because that is what I am. But if I am using the title, then it should follow that I am fully and totally obedient to him. If I call him Lord and yet I don't obey him, if I call him Lord and yet I do my own thing, that's totally inconsistent. And that is the inconsistency that many people have. Though they call him Lord, though they speak of the Lord, and they talk about the Lord, yet in reality, their life is not submitted unto him. Jesus asked, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet you don't do the things that I command you? He is, he is pointing out the inconsistency that so often does exist. People calling him Lord and yet not doing the things he commands. And so when he said, not all who say Lord, Lord are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of the Father, the emphasis is upon the doing of the will of God. Now, that's why we chose the book of James. Because James points out that a true faith works. I've thought about writing a commentary on James, and I've never really done an in-depth study on the book, and that's the reason why I chose to take the book of James. And I've been planning to write a commentary on James, and title it, The Faith That Works. You see, as James is so practical, he shows that if you don't have works, then all of your talk of faith is meaningless. 
Faith without works is dead. To call Jesus Lord is meaningless if you're not obeying him. If you're walking in the pride of your own heart. If you're walking in arrogancy. Then he isn't really Lord. Because he has told us to walk in humility. He has told us to walk in love. And thus James sort of lets you look in the mirror and see yourself as the Lord sees you, which is so important. To see ourselves as the Lord sees us. So Jesus is his name. When the angel came to Mary to announce to her that God had chosen her to be the human instrument by which God would bring his son into the world. The angel said to Mary, you will conceive and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. Now, when Joseph heard of Mary's pregnancy and was troubled. Hard to believe the story she was telling. Didn't know what to do. To expose her publicly would mean her death. The populace would stone her for her indiscretions. He couldn't bear that thought. He was thinking, maybe I'll just send her away, put her away privately. And while he was pondering on these things, the angel came to Joseph and said, Fear not to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She's going to bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is a Greek name for the Hebrew name Joshua. The Hebrew name Joshua is a contraction of the Hebrew name Jehoshua. Shua in Hebrew is salvation. So the name is actually Jehovah Shua or Jehovah is salvation. The becoming one has become your salvation. So the name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. That is why the angel said call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Christ is who he is. The Greek word Christos means anointed. It's the he translation of the Hebrew Mashiach. Jesus is the promised Mashiach or the promised anointed one. Now, when a king was crowned king. They would take a horn of oil and they would pour it over his head. The anointing, representing the anointing. And that signified his becoming king. You remember when uh, God rejected Saul from being king over Israel, told Samuel to go down to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem and there anoint one of Jesse's sons to be king. And how as the boys came prating through, and Samuel would think, wow, good looking, that must be the one. The Lord said, nope, not him. And, and finally, he said to Jesse, uh, are there any more boys? 
Well, there's just one, but he's just a, just a lad. He's out watching the sheep. Well, call him in. And as David came in, the Lord spoke to Samuel, and he took this horn of oil and he poured it over David's head, signifying that he was anointed of God to reign over the people. Now, this idea then of the Mashiach or the anointed one is the one that God has anointed to reign over the earth. The Messiah. The one that God has anointed to rule and to reign. And so the Old Testament prophets spoke of the Messiah that was to come, the anointed one of God, God's anointed king to reign over the world. And Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ. You remember when Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi with the disciples, he said, whom do men say that I am? And they told him some of the different uh, theories that were going around. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, you are the Christ or the Messiah, the son of the living God. So we think of Christ also as a name. It's not a name. Christ is who he is. He is the Messiah. His name is Jesus. He is our Lord. He is the promised Messiah. So the Lord, Jesus, the Messiah. John is addressing, I mean James is addressing this little epistle to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. God had warned the nation of Israel that if they did not listen to him, if they would walk contrary to him, in Leviticus 26, 33, he said, I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities wasted. Deuteronomy 4.25 The Lord said, When you shall beget children and children's children, and you shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land, whereunto you go over Jordan to possess it. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whether the Lord will lead you. And so God gave to them warning that if after they have dwelt in the land and their children's children, it's a very interesting thing that throughout history, God has moved many times among his people. And it's always an exciting thing to be in on a movement of God and to experience a movement of God. To be that generation that sees the work of God and the movement of God. But it is interesting that historically the movements usually die out by the time the third generation 
comes along. You see, there is that first generation that experiences the work and the movement of God. They've lived in that excitement. They've seen God work. And, and it's just an exciting thing always to, to be a part of a movement of God. So, when there is that movement of God, there is always that turning to God, that commitment to God, that abandonment unto the Lord and to the things of the Lord. And with that comes blessing. You see, basically, down bottom line, God loves his people and wants to bless them. God desires to give good gifts to his children. And so the moment there is that commitment. There comes then that blessing of God. Now with the blessings of God, we begin to share with our children what God did. But you know, somehow we don't want our children to have to go through some of the deprivations that we had. We don't want to have them have to just trust in the Lord. We want to see that they're well taken care of. And, and so we take those blessings that God has bestowed and, and we begin to sort of make sure that our kids don't have to you know, worry about where the meal is going to come from or where the rent, you know, dad will be there and, and dad will cover and, and all that because we don't want them to suffer the kind of deprivations that we suffered. And we want to make sure that they have a great education. Just not trust in the Lord completely, but, you know, go to college and get your degrees and all so you don't have to really uh, trust the Lord fully and completely. So they've heard about what God did, but they haven't experienced it. Theirs is only what they've heard. By the time the third generation comes along, they haven't even heard. That somehow, those that didn't experience have nothing to pass on. And so usually by the time the third generation comes, there's a rather an apostasy that takes place. It's interesting today, in fact, to me, it's tragic. As you go to Hawaii and you see the Bishop Foundation, now, the bishops were some of the early missionaries who went around Cape Horn and, and suffered all kinds of deprivations to take the gospel to the Hawaiians. And yet today, all of these institutions that were begun by missionaries have become wealthy kind of institutions totally godless. You take the Punahou School that was established uh, for uh, the children of missionaries. Now it is just as secular and ungodly as any school you'd ever attend. And so many of the missionary families, you know, the missionaries acquired the, the land when it was so cheap. And, and now the families are so far away. The third, fourth, fifth generations now. And there's no thought of God, no concern for God. Uh, the wealth and all has just uh, absorbed them so fully that there's just no, no thought of God. And that's, to me, a great tragedy, but it is something that is, we, we watch through history. 
the Old Testament, the book of Judges. It's just a cycle, continuing cycle, where they would seek the Lord and uh, they would be blessed and then they would turn away from God into idolatry. They would be then, uh, sub, they, would, they would be uh, subjugated by their enemies and, and they would be miserable and, and things would be taken away from them. They'd be poor and destitute. They'd cry unto God. God would hear them. God would, and they would turn to God and God would bless them. And then, you know, the, the gradual turning away. <laughs> I've, I, I've come to the, the, the place in life where uh, now whenever I'm interviewed by uh, magazine writers or uh, radio interviews or whatever, the, the question that invariably comes up is, what's going to happen when you die? Uh, I, I <laughs> guess I'm you know, beginning to show my age and people are beginning to think about that. And that is why I am so concerned with seeing that the next generation really experiences the work of God. That's why I go up to camp. That's why I plan to spend the summer uh, pretty much up at the camp with our kids this summer. I want them to experience firsthand the work of God. Not just tell them about what God did back in the 70s or whatever, but what God will do in their lives and, and challenge them to experience. You see, I feel confident that we've passed on to the next generation. We've got hundreds upon hundreds, thousands of pastors all over the country that we were able to pass on to that generation. And, and I'm confident that the next generation is, is out there. They're doing it. But it's the next generation I'm concerned about. And so that's why I'm devoting my life to the children. That's why we built that beautiful youth camp. So that we can bring the excitement of God's work firsthand to our children. And, and we can pass on to the next generation. So God here speaks to the children of Israel when you come in and, and your children's children and he speaks of then you turn away how that they'll be dispersed. And so it happened. They came into the land. They were blessed, but they turned from God. God sent the enemies against them, bring them back to God. And that was the cycle that continued until the final dispersion under the Romans in 70 A.D. Deuteronomy 28, 64, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there you shall serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. So, James is writing to the 12 tribes that have been scattered abroad. Scattered abroad because they didn't continue faithful unto the Lord. Scattered abroad because of the judgment of God upon them. Notice he doesn't address the epistle to the 10 lost tribes of Israel. There are those who try to identify the Anglo-Saxon nations with the ten tribes of Israel. And because the word ish in Hebrew is the word for man, uh, they say Danish. 
Dan, the tribe of Dan, Dan's men, Danish people, or the Danish people. Swedish. And I don't know what tribe Swede was, but... Uh, <laughs> But because of the ish, they, they try to uh, attach it to one of the ten tribes, but it's all fool-ish. <laughs> God knows where they are. They're not lost. God knows who they are. And in the book of Revelation, God will seal 12,000 from each tribe to compose that 144,000 who will be divinely protected from uh, a part of the uh, tribulation that is coming upon the earth and will be God's witnesses. But recognized, Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin. He knew that. Uh, and... Uh, so to the 12 tribes that have been scattered abroad, or writing again, basically, to the Jews. But there's a lot for us to gain from what he has to say to them. Father, we thank you for this brief introduction into the epistle of James. And Lord, we look forward to what you have to say to us as we study this practical epistle. We ask you, Lord, that we might be open to hear your voice, that we might allow the instruction to speak to our hearts, And Lord, we pray that you will bring us into a practical walk of obedience. Not just saying, Lord, Lord, but as with James, seeing ourselves as servants, the other side of the coin, servants of the Lord Jesus our Messiah. So Lord, we pray that as we get into this epistle that it will challenge our hearts to godly living, to practical Christian service, to a commitment of our ways to you. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.